Travel alert, using the stairway, you travel down, taking a minute to arrive, cautiously passing by the wood golem and descending the stairway, you enter what appears to be a large vault, a storage place for the woodworking workroom above. The smell of freshly cut timber permeates the air, a rather pleasing scent despite the dreariness of the chamber here. Shining your light about, you find a wide diversity of wood, wood products, tools, and supplies neatly stacked upon dozens of shelves, the vault surprisingly well organized. To learn more, however, you will need to give the chamber a good search. Searching the vault, you find all kinds of wooden objects, from whole planks and panels of wood recently cut from trees outside the stronghold to dozens of wooden possessions, including weapons, and a few shields. The craftsmanship is impeccable, the Dark Elves definitely know how to work with wood. This stuff is intriguing, Ariana comments, rummaging through a small crate of wooden trinkets. I could spend all day here searching. We don't have the time, Elf, Sainadius replies, not amused by the antics of Ariana. We should go. Before you depart, let's have Ariana try a curiosity check and see if she finds anything of genuine interest. Needing a 11 or less from Ariana, a 3 was rolled. Success, reaching the far southeastern corner, Ariana discovers a rather odd wooden door that apparently rolls up into the ceiling. Somewhat intrigued as well, Kartha joins Ariana as the elf continues to look about, hoping to find something of interest. The rest of you grow rather bored, however, wanting to leave. Inspecting the sliding door, Eswin slowly lifts it into the ceiling, revealing a small, hidden place in the corner. Embedded into the southern wall is a small, slightly glowing keyhole alongside a lever in the up position. While the keyhole obviously needs some sort of key, the lever appears to be locked in place, you can't currently push it down. Is there something in your inventory that may work in the keyhole? Janet offers uses the drow stronghold golden key. Retrieving the key you found earlier in the bedroom above, you try the keyhole, the object a perfect fit. Giving the key a turn, the glowing area around the keyhole brightens in intensity, providing a visual cue that something has been engaged. Now what? Kartha asks, waiting for something to happen. The metallic lever no longer locked in place, Eswin steps forward and pushes the lever down as far as it will go, the object making a definitive snapping noise as it's manipulated into place. Any ideas what that did? The warrior wonders aloud, turning back to you. It's likely part of a bigger puzzle, Oferi's response, approving of Eswin's manipulation of the lever. That's probably all we can do here. With the magical keyhole turned and the lever pulled down, you sense Ophiris is correct, you've done all you can hear and it's time to move on. Stone steps leading back up to the woodworking workroom is your only exit from this well-organized chamber. Barthol has a 55% chance of picking the lock and rolls a 44 on percentile dice. Success. The cabinet is unlocked and now easily opened. Inside, you find one coal brick and one water skin. Travel alert, using the stairway, you travel up, taking a minute to arrive, having descended into the woodworking vault, found the keyhole and pulled the metallic lever down, you suspect that you've done all you can down there and that now you need to move on to another encounter area. Travel alert, using the hallway, you travel east, taking 5 minutes to arrive, the relatively empty chamber here is safe and secure. Doors allow exit to the north and south, 
while open doorways lead away. Travel alert, using the unlocked door, you travel north, taking a few moments to arrive. Throwing some light into this rather dark chamber, it seems quite large, perhaps 100 feet to a side. Two things attract your immediate attention. First, the chamber appears filled with a diversity of golems, all standing still, at least for the moment. Peering at them, you recognize some clay golems, flesh golems, that are drow in origin, stone golems, wood golems, straw golems, and even a few types you haven't seen before. Second, in the center of the room stands a massive, ornate forge, radiating a pulsating aura of arcane energy, likely the place where most of these golems were created from. Entering the golem chamber to have a look around, you barely pass through the doorway before several large skeletons slowly animate before you, each with four arms carrying blade weapons. The monsters form a line between you and the center of the massive chamber, they don't attack, but they won't let you pass either. Bone golems, oh fairies huffs, concerned. They're not undead so we can't turn them, but they're blocking our way. Janet, what would you like to do, choose an option, diplomacy, talk to the bone golems, pessimism, attack the golems directly, tolerance, put away your weapons. Surprised by your order to put your weapons away in front of several dangerous adversaries, your heroes nonetheless obey your command, s win the last to disarm himself. Moments later, the bone golems do likewise, lowering their blade weapons and even standing aside, apparently standing down. Well done, you've resolved the encounter with the bone golems without having to take a single swing at them. Let's reward your peaceful approach to the encounter with a few bonus experience points. Each hero earns 444 experience points. Working your way toward the ornate forge in the center of the room, most of the golems here suddenly activate and turn in your direction. There are dozens and dozens of golems here, a wide diversity of them, and their sudden activation is alarming. As many of the golems begin to move toward you, a colossal bronze golem picks itself off the floor alongside the ornate forge and stands before you. Ten feet tall and weighing over two tons, the monster raises a fist to attack, a strike easily capable of killing a grown human being. We fought one of these before, back in the Jep Power Tower dungeon, s -win reminds your party. Watch out for its molten spray if you hit it. The monster then stomps toward you, about to attack. As the bronze golem attacks, the colossus happens to stomp its way toward Redfern, taking the magic user by surprise. Beginning a spell, Redfern won't be fast enough and will likely take a painful blow. Then, strangely, miraculously, the golem halts its attack, staring at Redfern for several long, fateful moments. Redfern looks to you, just as surprised as the rest of the party, then turns back toward the bronze golem as it then takes a step backward, straightens itself, and deactivates. Looking about, all the other golems have similarly withdrawn and are now deactivating themselves, you don't know why, but you're suddenly free to proceed. Not to seem ungrateful, but what just happened? Eswin wonders, inspecting Redfern as if he were a stranger. Ofaris looks Redfern over as well, surprised and even concerned. The sorceress then stutters over a direct question. Are you a, no, never mind. The sorceress about to suggest something she knows would be highly unlikely, she instead steps past the magic user and toward the ornate forge just 20 feet away. Nearing the ornate forge, the contraption continues to radiate a pulsating aura of arcane energy, a strong power in the air that you can actually sense. Certainly. This is where the various golems throughout the chamber are manufactured, put together and otherwise imbibed with their magical auras, and you're both fascinated and terrified by the forge. What is that? Ariana calls out, pointing toward the northern wall another 40 feet away. What appears to be a massive stone clock stands nearby against the far wall, something extremely out of place here and hence the next object for discovery. Approaching the clock, 
it appears over 20 feet tall and rests upon an altar of magical stone, the odd device deeply intriguing and yet warning you to keep your distance. This is circle magic, oh fairies is the first to comment, inspecting the contraption carefully without touching it. And extremely powerful, powerful enough to stop time itself. Is this what's keeping us here in the past? Kartha wisely asks. Most definitely, the sorceress responds with a nod. And we have to destroy it to return to our own time. I am guessing one does not just destroy something cast by the inner circle, S. Wynn cynically states. What's it going to take for us to break this magic? A time seal like this is surprisingly vulnerable to brute force trauma, O. Fairies responds, beginning to look about. Not by the likes of us, but perhaps one of these golems would do. Maybe that bronze golem we encountered? Redfern suggests, nodding back with his head. No, not even that. Something made of iron, perhaps. Let's take a look around. GM note, your source of light has just gone out, momentarily separating from one another to better search the massive chamber, it does not take long for your heroes to find a towering iron golem in the far northwestern corner, the party soon congregating back together alongside the object. Stay back, O fairy's orders, approaching the 12 foot tall creature of iron on her own. These things can spray poison gas, let me see what I can do. O fairy's looks to you, then slowly approaches the golem on her own, reaching out to touch it. Upon being touched, the iron golem immediately springs to life, raising its deadly short sword and preparing to breathe poison gas upon all of you. Red Fern. Oh fairies desperately calls out. I can't control it. Help me, now. The young magic user quite surprised, he looks to you in a moment of indecision, then cautiously steps over to Oferis and the golem, the latter preparing to attack. As Redfern reaches the iron golem, it suddenly halts its attack, lowering its short sword and standing ready for instructions. How? Redfern begins to mumble, not understanding why the golems in this chamber all seem controllable by him. Only a truistic of the inner circle can do this, Oferis responds, her demeanor suddenly quite serious. Order the golem to approach the clock over there. Redfern just stares at Oferis for several long moments as the rest of the party join her. The would-be truistic then turns, looks up to the iron golem and shouts an initial command. Golem, follow me. Astonishingly, the golem turns in Redfern's direction and takes a floor-shaking step, Redfern does indeed seem to be controlling the Colossus. The magic user smirks, then leads the Iron Golem, along with all of you back over to the magical clock about 30 feet away. What's going on? Sainadius asks, stepping alongside Kartha. How is he controlling the Golem? I don't think it's Redfern, actually, the mutant responds, keeping her voice down. It must be the spirit of Sand Arya still within Redfern. Back at the massive clock, Redfern stops alongside it as does the Iron Golem and then your party. Redfern then turns to Oferis for further instructions. Now, order the Golem to destroy the clock, Oferis continues, pointing toward the highly magical object. Is that wise? Eswin asks, concerned. Want that return us back to our own time? We haven't yet recovered the Wizard Bane. Well still remain in the past, the Sorceress confidently answers. But once the clock is destroyed, we will be able to return to our own time once we leave the stronghold. Do it, wizard. Oferis then orders Redfern, suggesting that everyone back away from the clock as well. Redfern nods and orders the iron golem to destroy the magical clock. At once, the colossus lifts its short sword into the air and then strikes the clock, magical sparks flying everywhere. Despite the tremendous strength of the golem, however, the initial attack does little damage. For the next 10 minutes, your party watches as the iron golem strikes the clock again and again, magical debris flying everywhere, 
a plume of glowing material that soon nearly obscures the clock. A very loud squeal suddenly rips throughout the chamber, emanating from the iron golem. Unsure of the sound, Redfern orders the golem to halt its attack on the clock and everyone in the party uses their hands to push away the lingering cloud of magical debris hanging in the air. Moments later, you discover two things. First, the magical clock is almost destroyed, just a few more strikes from the golem should do it. Second, however, you also recognize that the golem has broken its arm and hence can no longer attack the clock. Oh dear, oh fairies mutters, very disappointed. Now what do we do, choose an option, attack the clock yourselves, order the other golems to attack, try to repair the arm somehow. Can we try to fix the arm somehow? Ariana asks, the suggestion at first seemingly impossible. There is that forge and all those tools and supplies back in the metallurgy workroom we explored, Kartha states, always optimistic. I don't know if we can work all of that, but it's worth a try. Your heroes all look to one another, nodding with approval moments later. Redfern then orders the golem to detach its right arm, the metallic robot soon laying its heavily damaged appendage on the floor. Eswin and Ariana helping you to pick the object up, you will need to return to the metallurgy workroom for some emergency repairs. The circle's time-altering clock nearly, but not quite destroyed, there is nothing more you can do here until the iron golem's arm is repaired and reattached. So, go find a metallurgy workroom, get the arm repaired and then return to continue your assault on the circle's time-stop artifact. Ariana uses a glowing skull throughout the entire local area, illuminating everything well. Travel alert, using the hallway, you travel west, taking 10 minutes to arrive, spreading out, your heroes look around again, this time searching for something, anything, that may repair the iron golem arm you're holding. Are there any metallurgists in the party perhaps? Ophiris asks of you. Shaking your head no, the sorceress sighs and looks around again, your heroes not sure of what to do next. Searching the bookshelf tucked away in the northwestern corner, you soon find some books dedicated to basic welding and how to work with iron. As the books are written in the drow language, Oferi seizes them and gets to reading, instructing your party to start gathering some basic tools. Several hours later, Oferi believes that she's researched enough, time to try and repair the iron golem arm. Reheating the forge, finding an appropriate anvil and collecting the proper tools, your party then gets to work, doing its best to repair the break in the arm and make it as good as new. First, Let's try a party intelligence check to see if you properly apply what Ophiris has learned to the task. Needing a 14 or less from your heroes, a 10 was rolled. Success, yes, your heroes are able to follow the instructions of Ophiris adequately, at least going about the repairs in the proper way. While following Ophiris instructions well, there is still the matter of whether your heroes possess the natural ability to work the forge, strike the iron in the proper way and implement the repairs without damaging the arm further. Hence, let's do a party dexterity check now and see how that turns out. Needing a 14 or less from your heroes, a 7 was rolled. Success, working well together as a team, your heroes soon repair the iron golem arm enough so that it should work again, well done. Return to the golem laboratory, reattach the arm and see what happens. GM note, it's dark here. Click the use item button to select a source of light, nicely done with locating the iron golem arm, having the wits to try and repair it and then actually fixing the iron object. 
let's reward that ingenuity with some bonus experience points. Each hero earns 500 experience points. Having descended into the metallurgy vault, found the keyhole and pulled the metallic lever down, you suspect that you've done all you can down there and that now you need to move on to another encounter area. Ariana uses a glowing skull throughout the entire local area, illuminating everything well. Travel alert, returning to the Golem Laboratory, you take 10 minutes to arrive. Returning to the Golem Laboratory, Eswin helps you carefully lay the repaired arm alongside the Iron Golem. Then, with some appropriate instructions from Red Fern, the Golem Riata CHES the arm to its torso, picks up its short sword from the floor and begins attacking the magical clock again. This time, it only takes 4 or 5 blows before the clock explodes in a massive, nearly blinding surge of magical energy, knocking all of you to the floor. Standing back up and turning toward the golem, it appears destroyed as well, but so is the magical clock. Dusting yourselves off and returning to the clock ruins, Eswin is the first to speak. Is that it? Are we free to return to our own time now? I believe so, Oferis answers with a hint of a smile. Once we take that stairway that led us down here back up, we should emerge back in our own time, and this place will be forever lost in time again. Why did the circle do all this in the first place? Sainayers asks, a logical question. From everything we've seen, I believe the circle defeated the drow here but didn't recover the wizard bane, Ofari speculates, her opinion seeming truth. So, they turned the drow into night trolls and locked the stronghold in a time bubble so that only one of their own could return to it in the future. One of their own? Redfern asks, surprised by the comment. Who, here, is a truistic of the inner circle? As if suddenly the epicenter of the universe, all eyes fall on Redfern, their gaze more than answering his own question. Redfern, it's been you all along, you begin, initiating a long overdue conversation. Our return to Lord Robert's Tower, the defense against the inner circle and teleportation to Grimtier, your ability to command these golems. The soul of Sant Arya resides within you, for now at least, you have the power of a genuine truistic. Redfern is understandably shocked and initially wants to deny it all. Yet his reason and intellect temper his instinct to deny what must be the truth, and all the magic user can do is sigh and lower his head. In that moment, what would you like to say to Redfern, choose an option, empathy, we will protect you from her, optimism, it hasn't been all that bad, reason, maybe there is a reason for this? Fear not, my friend, you say as you place a comforting hand upon Redfern's shoulder. Maybe there is a reason for all of this, a reason why Sand Arya chose you. Maybe it's part of her grander plan. I... I don't feel her whatsoever, Redfern replies, still shocked and confused. If she's there, she hasn't made herself known to me. She's there all right, Eswin states matter-of-factly. Had it not been for her, we'd all be a pile of ash back at that giant dome with the circle. Your party agrees, solidifying the truth now within Redfern's mind. GM note, your quest log has been updated. Click the quests button for all the details, wait, what's this? Ariana calls out, interrupting the conversation. Peering through the destroyed magical clock mechanism on the floor, Ariana spots something and uses her new bow to poke through the debris. Your heroes join her, and within a minute or so you've revealed a stone stairway leading down. The circle must have placed their clock here to prevent passage below, Oferi speculates, intrigued. Perhaps this leads to the wizard bane? The whole party intrigued now, 
you spend another 15 minutes or so clearing more of the debris away so you can all safely descend. The Golem Laboratory area now fully explored and its challenges resolved, it's time to move along. You can certainly return through the doorway to the south, but the stairway down almost demands your immediate attention. Travel alert, using the stairway, you travel down, taking a minute to arrive, pushing past the remains of the magical, and nearly indestructible clock left behind by the circle above, you descend stone steps into another large area, this one dark as well. Taking an initial look around, you see more golems, many more golems, perhaps just as many as the floor above. Fortunately, all of them appear deactivated, so as you reach the floor of this lower chamber, none of them activate or take the slightest interest in your party. Inspecting the golems as well as the chamber, your heroes suspect that the golems here are older, less capable contraptions that either were no longer needed or perhaps used as spare parts. Not only are they deactivated but they don't even seem capable of being activated anymore, all of them asleep in natural silence. Searching the chamber a little more, you then come across a single door in the southern wall, no doorknob or obvious means of opening it but a glowing keyhole to the right of the door. Let's do a party intelligence check to see what your heroes may discern regarding the door and keyhole. Needing a 14 or less from your heroes, a 2 was rolled. Success, the door is highly magical, Ophares begins, feeling its surface with her hands. That key we found in the bedroom above should open it. Since there is no other way to open this door than with a very special key, you will need to use something equally as special from your backpack. Janet offers uses the Drow Stronghold Golden Key. Recognizing the obvious here, you insert the golden key into the keyhole and give it a turn. At once, the glowing panel turns a rich golden color and you take a step back, expecting the magical door itself to somehow open. Unfortunately, however, it does not, you are still prohibited from continuing south. That, should have worked. Ophares mumbles, surprised that the door is still quite closed. Then there must be something else we need to do, Kartha hypothesizes. We'll need to do some further exploration of this stronghold and return later. Nodding in agreement, you recognize that you will need to do something else before you can return to this chamber and try the door again. What that is, exactly, is anyone's guess, but it appears you will need to ascend back up to the Golem Laboratory and start searching the Drow Stronghold again. GM Note, your source of light has just gone out, your party rests and recovers for 8 hours. Wounds are tended, spells are memorized and your hero Ariana uses a glowing skull throughout the entire local area, illuminating everything well. Travel alert, using the stairway, you travel up, taking a minute to arrive, unable to open the magical door down in the golem vault, your party travel alert, using the hallway, you travel east, taking 5 minutes to arrive, entering yet another dark chamber, you aim your equipped light inside, casting eerie shadows upon the walls and taking an initial look around. Broken looms, shredded fabrics and tangled threads cover the floor, creating a chaotic tapestry of destruction within what appears to be a textile workroom. The air is thick with the smell of mildew, dampness, and the foul stench of yet more trolls who have claimed this territory as their own. You know the drill by now, you will have to search the chamber to learn more, likely inviting an attack by the night trolls that hide within. Stepping into the large chamber and having a look around, the night trolls at first stay within the shadows, you know they're there, but they don't attack, buying you a little time. Unfortunately, 
the massive chamber does not seem to contain anything of value or importance, this is where the drow work their textiles to clothe themselves and otherwise stitch things together, but most of the equipment is damaged beyond repair now and all the provisions and supplies are lying about in a chaotic mess. Against the northeastern wall, your heroes then encounter a large, beautiful tapestry hanging from the ceiling, some 20 feet across and quite colorful. Taking a closer look, the tapestry appears to depict the wizard Bane artifact in all its glory, the sword dominating the center of the tapestry. A series of simple images appear to encircle the blade, each rather mysterious but colorful as well. This tapestry appears dedicated to the wizard Bane, Ariana begins, appreciating the artistry and workmanship integrated into the unique textile. As if there to defend the tapestry, the lurking trolls suddenly spill out of the shadows and attack, nearly taking your party by surprise. Several of the trolls are still wearing the dark elf clothing they originally had on when they were transformed, the clothing nearly ripped to shreds upon the much larger monsters. Put M down. S wing cries, leading your party against the night trolls. Your party is under attack. Coming at all of you are five night trolls. It's Ariana's turn. What do you want her to do? Ariana readies her longsword plus two and swings at night troll number three. Marioleth casts lightning bolt on roughly half of all encountered combatants, electrocuting them, night troll number one avoid- It's Janet's turn. What do you want her to do? Janet uses a glowing skull throughout the entire- Redfern casts Fireball on roughly half of all encountered combatants, blasting them in an explosion of flame, Night Troll number 1 is needing a 50 or less on percentile dice, a 59 is rolled. Failure. Arthal St. Aetius casts Spiritual Hammer on Night Troll. Ophiris casts Ice Storm on roughly half of all encountered combatants, Night Troll number 1 is pummeled for 47 points of damage, needing a 14 or greater. Night Troll number 1 rolls. Kartha casts Cause Moderate Wounds on Night Troll number 5, nearly wounding it, needing a 14 or greater. Night Troll number 5. Well done. All combatants have been defeated, ending the battle. Each hero receives 525 experience points. As instructed by Eswin, the trolls are put down and silenced forever their pathetic lives taken but their stench remaining. Returning to the tapestry, your party continues its inspection, wondering if perhaps there is something to learn by its study. The tapestry is definitely dedicated to the wizard Bane, Ophiris begins, pointing toward it. But these objects orbiting around it, are they merely decorative or do they have actual meaning? There appear to be three cryptic images woven into the fabric in concentric circles around the wizard bane, each colorful and distinctive enough to potentially represent something. So, let's do a party intelligence check to see what you make of these strange shapes here. Needing a 14 or less from your heroes, a 13 was rolled. Success. The outer circle, Kartha points out, several strange, artistic elements woven within. Could that represent an opening, a door perhaps, or even a keyhole? Possibly, Redfern adds, tracing the woven elements in the air with his own fingers. And those, four of them, metal rods. They're all the same. We need to find four of these and place them all in the same position, Ariana suggests with a grin. Next, let's do another party intelligence check to see if you can deduce the meaning of the second concentric circle within the tapestry. Needing a 14 or less from your heroes, a 5 was rolled. Success. GM note, your quest log has been updated. Click the quests button for all the details. The middle circle, Sainadier suggests, now nearly as intrigued with the tapestry as the rest of you. It's dark, like some netherworld, not a place for mortals. But this depiction here, some sort of ghostly being. Kartha points, the image barely perceptible. A spirit perhaps, 
or some otherwise outer-worldly thing, may be a guardian. Again Opharyx nods, your party having now deduced two of the three spheres encircling the wizard bane. Let's do a final party intelligence check to see if you can determine what the inner concentric circle of the tapestry may represent. Needing a 14 or less from your heroes, a 16 was rolled. Failure. GM note, your quest log has been updated. Click the quests button for all the details, try as you might, your heroes just can't deduce the meaning behind the last circle, you've taken this as far as you can. The night trolls here taken care of and the tapestry studied as best you could, there appears to be little more to do here within the textile workroom, the southern door your only egress out. Deciding to give the tapestry not just a more thorough search but feel as well, you're quite surprised to find that a portion of the northern wall behind the large object appears to be missing. Lifting the appropriate section of the tapestry up, you then discover a concealed stairway down, 10 feet wide and leading into complete darkness. Well done, you now have an alternative exit to explore. The encounter area now fully explored, there truly isn't anything more for you to do here. You can return through the doorway to the south, but naturally you will want to explore the stairway leading down as well. Travel alert, using the stairway, you travel down, taking a minute to arrive, descending the stairway, you enter what appears to be a large vault, a likely storage place for the textile workroom above. The scent of fresh fabric permeates the air, confirming your hypothesis. Directing your light about the chamber from the middle of the stairway, you see rows of towering shelves filled with fabrics, along with a diversity of tools and supplies needed to transform silk into textiles. In the darkness, you don't see any signs of night trolls, so it appears safe to enter the chamber and look around. Carefully searching the vault, you find a wide variety of silk bolts, rolls of fabric, quite the diversity of clothing and even some woven tapestries, along with all the equipment and supplies needed to create all these textiles. The clothing, especially, is quite impressive, the dark elves here able to work wonders with the silks and fabrics they possessed. Due to the degree of stuff found down here, let's do a party curiosity check to see if you discover anything of any real use or importance. Needing a 11 or less from your heroes, a 3 was rolled. Success. Discovering a strange, sealed box tucked away in the northeastern corner of the vault, Eswin hauls the box out and pries the lid off with a nearby crowbar. Inside are a dozen or so woven cloaks, expertly fabricated and likely designed exclusively for magic users. Curious, Redfern begins to rummage through the cloaks, intent on trying to find one that may fit, and look dashing on him as well, of course. At the bottom of the box, he then discovers an odd-looking cloak, its dark colors strangely iridescent and, at first, Redfern has a rather hard time even pulling the cloak from the box. My, I haven't seen one of those in years. Ophiris gasps with a smile. It seems, magical, Redfern replies, holding the cloak up for all to see and inspecting it closely. What is it? It's a cloak of displacement, Ophiris answers, feeling the possession for herself. Once worn, attackers will misplace where you're standing and make it harder for them to hurt you. Nice find. Redfern grins, then puts the cloak on, raising his armor class plus three. As Ophiris said, nice find. Over here. Ariana then commands from the other side of the vault. Your heroes quickly congregating near the central part of the far southern wall, you encounter something quite unexpected, several large spiders, the size of strong horses, chained to the wall here amidst dozens of webs. The spiders have already noticed Ariana and watch all of you approach as if rather tamed pets anxiously awaiting their next meal. 
Let's do a party intelligence check here to see if you can discern anything useful. Needing a 14 or less from your heroes, a 16 was rolled. Failure, well, you're guessing that the drow may have been using the spiders to harness their silk, but that's about all that occurs to you here. Suddenly, one of the spiders starts making a commotion, jumping up and down as much as its chain will let it and squealing like it wants something. This, in turn, causes the other two spiders to react similarly, all three now acting aggressively and becoming a real threat. As the spiders jump about in rapid fashion, what do you do? Choose an option, attack the spiders and destroy them, feed the spiders some of your rations, leave the spiders, and the vault. Janet permanently increases her empathy score by one point, hoping that all they're looking for is some food, you bust out a few of your rations and toss them to the spiders. The large, hairy tarantula sees their jumping to devour the rations, they're definitely hungry. Unfortunately, the spiders have no use for humanoid food and react by leaping about again, this time breaking their chains and leaping toward you to attack. As the giant tarantulas attack, they first emit a terrible shrieking, something you've never encountered before. The initial shrieks end and the giant tarantulas jump into the party in earnest, biting at everyone as if they haven't fed in months. Your party is under attack. Eyeing the entire party are three giant shrieking tarantulas. It's Eswin's turn. What do you want him to do? Eswin uses a boots of speed on himself, allowing himself to act twice each round for 5 minutes. It's Ophara's turn. What do you want her to do? Ophiris casts lightning bolt on roughly half of all encountered combatants, electrocuting them, giant shrieking tarantula number 1 is electrocuted for 30 points of damage, needing a 15 or greater, giant shrieking tarantula number 1 roll, it's red fern's turn. What do you want him to do? Redfern casts Invisibility 10 radius on roughly half the party, potentially, rendering invisibility on them, Janet avoids the effect altogether Ariana is now invisible for 10 minutes Barthol is now invisible for 10 minutes Kartha is now invisible for 10 minutes Marialeth is now invisible for 10 minutes Oh, it's Barthol's turn. What do you want him to do? Barthol binds the wounds of Ophiris, returning her hit points to zero and stopping her bleeding. Giant Shrieking Tarantula number 1 attacks Barthol with its bite needing an 18 to hit. Die roll is a 11, plus 3 to hit, Giant Shrieking Tarantula number 1 misses Barthol. Giant Shrieking Tarantula number 1 again attacks Barthol with its shriek nearly paralyzing him for a short time, needing a 7 or greater, Barthol rolls a 8 and saves versus Paralysis or Petrify. It's Karthus turn. What do you want her to do? GM note, a new combat round has begun. Initiative is rolled, with higher values acting first, car- Redfern uses a wand of lightning bolts on roughly half of all encountered combatants, electrocuting them, giant shrieking tarantula number one is electrocuted for 12 points, Ophiris casts Magic Missile on Giant Shrieking Tarantula number 3, striking it with a Magic Missile for 12 points of damage. Giant Shrieking Tarantula number 3 has been defeated. Well done. All combatants have been defeated, ending the battle. Each hero receives 245 experience points. 
the last of the three shrieking monstrosities goes down, your party needing to destroy the spiders to best resolve the battle. Damn spiders! S. Win laments, putting away his weapon. What were they doing here anyway? The drow were likely milking them for their silk, Red Fern replies, not as angry as S. Win. They were just hungry, it's a shame we had to end them like that. Always inquisitive, Ariana steps into the space occupied by the spiders and pulls back some webbing against the wall, revealing a small, glowing keyhole alongside a lever in the up position. While the keyhole obviously needs a key, the lever appears to be locked in place, you can't currently push it down. Is there something in your inventory perhaps that may work in the keyhole? Janet offers uses the drow stronghold golden key. Retrieving the key you found earlier in the bedroom, you try the keyhole, the object a perfect fit. Giving the key a turn, the glowing area around the keyhole brightens in intensity, visually cueing you that something has been engaged. Your heroes wait for something to happen but nothing does, looks like there is something more to do here. The metallic lever no longer locked in place, S. Wynn steps forward and pushes the lever down as far as it will go, the object making a definitive snapping noise as it's manipulated into place. The lever is down, the warrior announces, turning back to you. I hope that's what we needed to do. It's likely part of a bigger puzzle, O'Ferry's response, approving of S. Wynn's manipulation of the lever. That's all we can do here. With the magical keyhole turned and the lever pulled down, you sense O'Ferries is correct, you've done all you can hear and it's time to move on. Stone steps leading back up to the textile workroom represent your only escape from this well-organized, and now spider-less chamber. Janet casts cure moderate wounds on Eswin, healing him for 19 hit points. Janet casts Cure Light Wounds on Ariana, healing her for 8 hit points. Sainadiers cast Cure Light Wounds on Eswin, healing him for 8. Kartha casts Cure Light Wounds on Eswin, healing him. Kartha casts Cure Light Wounds on Ophares, healing her for 8 hit points. GM note, your source of light has just gone out, your party rests and recovers for 8 hours. Wounds are Ariana uses a glowing skull throughout the entire local area, illuminating everything well. Travel alert, using the stairway, you travel up, taking a minute to arrive, having descended into the textile vault, found the keyhole and pulled the metallic lever down, you suspect that you've done all you can down there and that now you need to move on to another encounter area. Travel alert, using the hallway, you travel east, taking 5 minutes to arrive, opening the large door to this dark chamber and throwing in some light, you initially see dozens if not hundreds of boxes, crates, chests and other containers stacked neatly in a dozen rows across the floor. This is clearly some sort of storage area, likely the raw materials and supplies needed for the other workrooms to the west. Examining the far shadows for signs of night trolls, you're a little relieved when you don't find any, maybe this chamber is relatively safe to enter and explore? Exploring the massive chamber, there is way too many containers here to open individually, 
it appears that the Dark Elves have enough materials and supplies down here to keep their stronghold going for years to come. However, while the diversity of stuff is intriguing, there is nothing you can really do with it. Poking about a bit more, let's do a party altruism check and see what happens. Needing a 12 or less from your heroes, a 7 was rolled. Success, there is so much stuff here, Kartha begins, onto something. The drow must have put nearly everything it possessed into this stronghold, likely at the cost of the people back in Leakley. Most of them probably didn't even know about the stronghold, Ofaris responds, tired now of looking around. This was likely a secret operation, which didn't stay secret, apparently. Reaching the far north central area of the chamber, your party then encounters a strange circular area on the floor, some 20 feet in circumference and the stone painted in off-white. It's definitely worth taking a closer look. Inspecting the floor, you're pretty sure that the circular area is actually floating in place and that it's likely meant to be raised and lowered. And what might this be used for? St. Aeus asks, poking at the stone with his toe. It's a levitation pad, Ofaris answers, its intent obvious to her. There must be another level below containing more provisions. While most of the chamber has now been surged, let's do a party curiosity check to see if you notice anything else here. Needing a 11 or less from your heroes, a 13 was rolled. Failure, no, unfortunately, your heroes don't notice anything further and that is that. With little more to do here within the raw materials workroom, it's time to move on. You can depart the chamber through the southern exit or you can take the levitation pad down to a lower level. Travel alert, using the levitation pad, you travel down, taking a minute to arrive, descending into this darkened vault atop the levitation pad, your light exposes a massive storage chamber, dozens of rows of stone shelving each containing hundreds of small boxes, likely filled with a cornucopia of raw materials and supplies. Fortunately, you don't see any sign of night trolls, so your exploration of the vault here should be a safe one. Carefully searching the vault, you find a wide variety of raw materials and supplies, from metal, wood, and textile resources to all the smaller things needed to run an underground stronghold and everything in between. Indeed, if you could somehow teleport everything down here back to your home village of Tobin, you'd have enough resources to run the village for years, decades, perhaps. However, none of it is important or useful and you sense that your search, while intriguing, has been a big waste of time. Reaching the far southern edge of the chamber, you then detect just the slightest distortion in the air alongside one of the shelves, something that does not seem right. Aiming your light in exactly the right direction, you suddenly encounter some sort of crystal being standing there, nearly completely transparent and, apparently, counting some small items within one of the boxes on the shelf. Your heroes converge on your location, watching the crystal humanoid go about its business, barely perceptible in the light and, so far at least, not taking any interest in your party whatsoever. What is it? Eswin is the first to ask, eyeing the crystal creature carefully. It's a crystal golem, Ofaris answers, recognizing the automaton. They're used by magic users as guards or workers to do mundane things in silence. Like taking inventory? Sainayers asks, Ofaris nodding correctly in response. Let's ask it something, Kartha suggests, stepping to the golem moments later to make a request, choose an option, did the circle just attack this stronghold? How do we find the wizard bane? Where are all the drow? Apparently understanding Kartha's question, the hairless, androgynous crystal humanoid silently turns toward her, possessing no actual face but definitely moving of its own free will. Moments pass and the crystal golem fails to respond. Kartha looks to you, 
then back to the golem. Then, the automaton raises its right hand to the place its mouth would be if it had one, pausing again as if now you need to do something. The action quite strange and not understood, let's do a party intelligence check to see if your heroes can determine anything here. Needing a 14 or less from your heroes, a 12 was rolled. Success, I believe it wants some sort of password, Ophares finally suggests, suddenly concerned. We need to prove that we're not an enemy. Moments pass, your party simply not sure of what to do with the golem. Without warning, the golem then disappears, and immediately Kartha is attacked by something, the crystal humanoid is now apparently both invisible and hostile. As Kartha defends herself and readies her own weapon to fight back, the rest of your party is assaulted as well, additional invisible golems having deemed you as enemies and now starting to pummel all of you with their strong stone fists. Your party is under attack. Coming at all of you are six crystal golems. It's Ophara's turn. What do you want her to do? Ophiris casts Ice Storm on roughly half of all encountered combatants, Crystal Golem number 1 is pummeled for 22 points of damage, needing a 15 or greater, Ariana readies her longsword plus 2 and swings at Crystal Golem number 5, needing a 15 to hit. Du Marioleth casts Magic Missile on Crystal Golem number 1, striking it with a Magic Missile for 7 points of damage. Crystal Golem number 1 has been defeated. Well done. All combatants have been defeated, ending the battle. Each hero receives 370 experience points. Your heroes smash the last of the Crystal Golems, destroying them forever, their ruined crystallized bodies remaining invisible on the cold stone floor. What a waste of time. S. Win laments, putting away his weapon. Let's go. Wait, what's that? Peering through the shelving unit against the southern wall here, Redfern spots a small, glowing keyhole alongside a lever in the up position, the whole thing concealed by the shelving until now. While the keyhole obviously needs a key, the lever appears to be locked in place, you can't currently push it down. Is there something in your inventory that may work in the keyhole? Janet offers uses the drow stronghold golden key. Retrieving the key you found earlier in the bedroom, you try the keyhole, the object a perfect fit. Giving the key a turn, the glowing area around the keyhole brightens in intensity, visually cueing you that something has been engaged. Your heroes wait for something to happen but nothing does, looks like there is something more to do here. The metallic lever no longer locked in place, Eswin steps forward and pushes it down as far as it will go, the object making a definitive snapping noise as it's manipulated into place. The lever is down, the warrior announces, turning back to you. I hope that's what we needed to do. It's likely part of a bigger puzzle, Ophiris responds, approving of Eswin's manipulation of the lever. That's all we can do here. With the crystal golems destroyed, the magical keyhole turned and the lever pulled down, you sense Ophiris is correct, you've done all you can hear and it's time to move on. The teleportation pad that brought you down here appears to be your only way out, so ascend upon the pad when you're ready to return to the workroom above. Travel alert! Using the levitation pad, you travel up, taking a minute to arrive, having descended into the raw materials vault, found the keyhole and pulled the metallic lever down, you suspect that you've done all you can down there and that now you need to move on to another encounter area.
Travel alert, returning to the Golem Laboratory, you take 10 minutes to arrive, unable to open the magical door down in the Golem Vault, your party returns to the laboratory here to reassess the situation and try something else. Note that if you're a little stuck, try exploring the chambers to the west and east of this Golem Laboratory, as you've missed something. Travel alert, using the stairway, you travel down, taking a minute to arrive, returning to the golem storeroom, the southern door still appears closed and nothing has changed. Moments later, the southern door creaks open, you've done it. Peering past the door, you can see a grand hallway beyond. And that is that, oh fairy smirks, happy to have helped solve this little puzzle. Shall we, then? The magical door in the southern wall finally opened, you can now continue south into a grand entrance hall. GM note, your source of light has just gone out, your party rests and recovers for 8 hours. Wounds are tended, spells are memorized and your heroes are refreshed and re-energized. Ariana uses a glowing skull throughout the entire local area, illuminating everything well. Barthol has a 55% chance of picking the lock and rolls a 29 on percentile dice. Success. The cabinet is unlocked and now easily opened. Unfortunately, the cabinet has nothing of value. <laughs>